tandem. Um, but it says I'm sharing an application. It says that I am recording it. So we are going to go forward with this. Um, this is actually one of my more favorite things to talk about. Um, I'm particularly interested in this subject of the Second Great Awakening uh, for a variety of reasons. One is I feel that I also I teach actually um, a course on this at another school uh, uh, called American Social Movements, and really it's American social not American social movements, but just social movements in general um, from 1945 to the present. And um, I'd like to teach a course here on American social movements. There is a course offered. I have not seen it in the fall, but there is this course uh, on American social movements. And to understand, I think to understand the United States in any realm, you kind of have to understand American religion. And you have to understand that American religious expression and American social reform kind of come from the same roots in the 19th century. And so this Second Great Awakening period I find particularly fascinating because you really get a sense of as the United States is beginning as a country, you're beginning to see the first hints that American political expression and religious expression are taking the same track. So today when we see how that is clearly true in American politics, how American religion is so, so intertwined with American political expression, um, and how the United States is really, by most measures, one of the most religious countries on earth, at least in terms of people who identify themselves as religious. Percentage-wise, the United States far outstrips almost every country on earth. I think it's like second to India or something. I'm really just citing you know, statistics that I have heard before, so don't quote me on that. But it's a particularly religious country in terms of these different expressions. And where does that come from? What's odd about that is you would think that from a country which has its beginnings in the ideas of religious liberty, that people should be able to believe what they want, you might have the opposite. You might have people being being freed from religion as many of uh, many uh, uh, philosophers and sociologists and have believed that would happen with an expansion of religious liberty and being able to think for themselves. That has not really been the case in the United States. So what I want to go back to is this period of time um, in the 1820s, 1830s, kind of at the same, this is happening at the same time as the um, Jacksonian period where you have this increase in the idea of the president, um, this increasing idea of the power of the president, also this increasing idea of the power of individual Americans to vote and have their own voices heard. At the same time, you're having an increase in the number of Americans who believe that they can believe what they want and that there is a marketplace of religion of which they are a part. And I think this is a really, really important Thing that's happening at the same time as the Jacksonian era and is off is a is a parallel track as you were if you want to separate out religion and politics think about the Jacksonian period as the political expression um, and think of the second great awakening as kind of the religious expression but they're both happening at the same time and they're all part of understanding the period of time in the United States between say 1820 and 1860 um, so I am going to make sure this is recording real quickly. Editorial, uh, recording in progress. All right. So let me go to the slide again. Um, so the Second Great Awakening. Why do we call it the Second Great Awakening? Well, just like, you know, um, Fast and Furious 8 was a sequel to Fast and Furious 7, right? You guys both saw that, right? Um, I'm kidding. Um, the Second Great Awakening had to have a First Great Awakening. There's no such thing as a Second Great Awakening if you don't have a First Great Awakening. And the First Great Awakening took place about 70 years before the Second Great Awakening. And the First Great Awakening, which we talked about briefly in class, was a period of time before the Revolution in which American colonists, remember it's not the United States at the time, American colonists are returning to churches or returning to expressions of faith in a way, there had been a dip. You had the first Puritans come over. There is a sort of a, a dip in American religiosity from about, say, 1680 to 1720. Um, and then you have another explosion of this. You have different denominations being 
kind of invented and kind of coming about Methodist and Baptist and these different religious expressions are coming out and they're becoming really popular in the United States excuse me in the American colonies and many people believe that first great awakening created sort of paved the way for the free thought expressions that you see in the American Revolution and the American Revolution is not seen as a particularly religious time. Uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin were not particularly religious people overtly. They talked in religious terms and used terminology, but they often kept organized religion at a kind of arm's length. It wasn't something that was very much informed their political worldview as much as um, um, as much as uh, their politics kind of informed their religious world here, I guess you'd say. In any case, this second Great Awakening comes about during a different time, whereas the first Great Awakening is coming about during a colonial period. The second Great Awakening is coming about during a time when the United States is a country. And the United States is a country founded on certain ideals, certain ideals which were not commonly accepted at the time of the first Great Awakening. So those ideals might be, as we have in this era of democratization, that everybody should be able to vote to a certain extent, that the the suffrage should be increased for more people. People should be able to think for themselves. People they enshrined in the Constitution and enshrined in the Declaration of Independence is this idea of religious liberty. People should be able to think for themselves and be able to choose what religious expression they want. And so these social factors, which are kind of present born at the beginning of the United States, as goes on into its 40th and 50th and 60th year, more and more people are seeing in, um, in religion the same kind of freedom of choice that they see in sort of their ability to pick a leader. So you can see these as parallel, um, uh, parallel um, processes. One thing about Second Great Awakening, which we can see is that it's happening to a certain extent on the frontier that the Amer united states is expanding into the west into this notion of that there is a frontier out there between sort of native american habitation which is seen as non-christian right and this rising movement of generally anglo white christians moving west um and on this frontier in the absence of organized churches and organized towns and towns that have been there for a while, as you have back in New England, as you have back in the South, on this frontier, you have to kind of think for yourself. You have little churches that spring up. You have itinerant preachers that come through. And so there's more, the idea is that on this frontier, you're having this explosion of religious faith. And we'll see this when we get to Mormonism at the end of this, this particular lecture. Um, Another thing is denominationalism. You're having also, just as you had the birth of sort of Methodism and Baptists in the 18th century, those denominations are competing for souls in the United States. So just as, just as you have traveling salesmen in this new United States who are going and selling Bibles, which is one of the most famous things that traveling salesmen are selling at this time. You have people going on these sales routes and selling out of catalogs and, and selling things. Preachers are going from town to town to town selling different expressions of religious faith. And whereas you might see that as quite cynical, you might say, no, these preachers are doing something to save souls. They're doing this to, 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 to create, you know, to bring about you know the kingdom of god on earth etc 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 they're also trying to make money i mean these preachers have to eat too you know preachers need food so and preachers and we see this in american religion today with mega churches and televangelism and churches are businesses right they might be nonprofit businesses but they're businesses and one of the big expressions of american business in the early 19th century is religion you can make money off of religion and people realize this so not to be totally cynical about this but to not to ignore this is just not seeing you know the truth of what's going on so there's a marketplace of religion in the absence of any sort of squelching of religious liberty religion is something which can be sold widely and different expressions of it can be sold widely and that's why you see in the 1820s and 1830s and 1840s in the United States an absolute explosion of different types of religious faith. That goes for different denominations. You have um, 
denominations like the Disciples of Christ, the Churches of Christ, the uh, Seventh Day Adventists, the Millerites, the Mormons, the um, I could go on and on and on. Different expressions of Baptist faith. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of expressions of this. And we have to include in that not only those groups that now have denominations and churches today that were born during this period of time in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s, but you also have to include all the social reform movements, which took religiously oriented members from different faiths and grouped them into social reform movements like abolitionism, like women's rights, like the uh, prison, the, the uh, uh, reform of the prison movement. The all of these movements are also um, are also religious expressions, although they are not in the context of a particular denomination. So that's so American spirituality is something which we have to talk about at the same time that we're talking about different religious denominations. So whereas you might have a group called the Mormons, you might also have a group called the Abolitionists. They're both coming out of the Second Great Awakening. And then we're also going to talk about transcendentalists, which kind of create a new form of American literary expression. They're not the only ones that do this, but out of transcendentalism and out of the Second Great Awakening, you also have the beginnings of an American literature. You have the, the first times in which American literature is being respected. And I talk about United States literature in particular when I talk about American literature. United States literature is being read in Europe. Um, Americans are reading less European literature. They're reading more of their own homegrown literature, which is being informed by this time also. So you have you have creative expression, religious expression, social reform expression. All of this is springing up at the same time in the United States, just as you have political expression in the Jacksonian period. Um, there's a famous um, book um, um, by Nathan Hatch, which talks about this, which talks about um, the democratization of American Christianity and says that spiritual equality for all is being united and being seen as the same thing as democracy. So political and religious liberty are now intertwined. They cannot be torn apart, really. People don't really see them as separate. Your ability to think for yourself and your ability to vote are the same. It's a terribly anti-authoritarian form of human expression, which is coming about in the United States. And we have to understand that this is relative, it's not unique. But in a country as large as this United States, which is being created, these forces are uniquely kind of simmering in this cauldron um, of the early United States in its first uh, 50 or 60 years. You have the first part of the 19th century, huge Baptist and Methodist revivals, which I love to I love to think of them as if you think of like large festivals today, large music festivals like Woodstock, for instance, in the 1960s, or I'm going to say Lollapalooza, although nobody goes to that anymore. You know, just these large expressions, Governor's Ball, just these large multi day music festivals are really a kind of religious expression that takes its roots from these large religious revivals of the early 19th century. Uh, because during the 19th century, remember, you don't have recorded music, you don't have amplification. People are coming from miles and miles around to gather in fields to listen to preachers, and it's entertaining. Um, and it has to be entertaining, and that's one way that they're selling their faith. Um, one important thing I want to talk about in the second grade awakening, we're going to talk, talk about this uh, extensively in the beginning of this particular um, at the beginning of this particular lecture is uh, um, Excuse me one second here. Um, just let me take one break. Uh, da -da. Yeah. Um, is how this, this explosion is affecting slavery. It's not the only thing that it's doing, but there's nothing that does not include slavery during this period of time, whether it's political or religious. Some of its effects on slavery are one, you have the rise of abolitionism abolitionists come out of this period and are often they come through it through other social reform movements they come through it through different forms of spirituality but they many of them arrive at abolitionism is that destroying slavery destroying this american sin is the number one goal of um, of their goal that only in destroying slavery can the united states be made perfect can the united states be, can the kingdom of God come 
to the United States. And this is a belief that many abolitionists have. Many abolitionists become, are pretty devout that way. Another effect on slavery is that you have in the South people believing that slavery is the natural state of human affairs and it is governed and it is in the Bible. That in the Bible, is, slavery is sanctioned. Slavery is a positive good. We'll talk about that. So you have these two differing kind of movements among at least white Americans. Among slaves, slaves and African Americans, both free blacks and African Americans who are enslaved at the time, are also experiencing the Second Great Awakening. There is an explosion of religious ex expression within slave communities. This is not something which is which is limited to um, sort of white Americans who are, are, are thinking about this. So slavery itself is being changed inside, and you're having these forms of belief in a promised day of liberation for slaves, which is part and parcel of this period of time also. Um, and I think it was two important things, or one is salvation can come through, as I said, with abolition and through social reform. It doesn't have to come through, say, going to church and praying and saying Hail Mary or whatever it is that one does in a particular denomination. It can come through actually acting to destroy slavery, actually acting to prevent the consumption of alcohol, actually acting to do this or that or that. So your actions on earth have the ability to create a sort of utopia on earth in the context of the United States. And all of that gets wrapped up in the idea of the United States as kind of like a missionary uh, nation. And that also, last point here, is the identification of the United States as a peculiarly Christian nation. Remember, the United States, when it begins, begins on religious liberty. So it doesn't necessarily begin on one faith or the other being ascendant. The founding fathers knew that those differences could create enmity and had destroyed Europe for centuries over and over again in wars and wars and wars and wars. So fighting over these denominational differences made no sense. But increasingly during the Second Great Awakening, you have this identification, which continues to this day in some quarters, that the United States is Christian. And that, that again, that's not so, because there are many Jews, there are many Muslims, there are many people of different religious faiths inside the United States, even back in the 1820s and 1830s. But this connection of the mission of the United States as being peculiarly connected to the mission of Christianity, which is bringing back of the second coming of Christ, for instance, in evangelical circles, um, or bringing about some sort of you know utopia for, for humanity. These ideas become bound up in old, sort of old Christian stories and old Christian um, kind of ideas. And so this is an important, this is really the galvanizing sort of forging point of that concept of the United States as Christian. I'm not saying that it is, or that, but that many people still believe that it is, and you hear that a lot. So I think it's important to talk about it that way. Um, let me go on. I'm going to turn on captions, and I'm going to, going to do a little test to see if they work. So. Can you see those captions on the screen? Yeah. yeah, OK, we'll see if they, I'm going to turn them off after this slide just to see if they work, because I'm not sure if they messed up my previous uh, recording. Anyway, let's go to slavery. We're going to start with slavery, um, <clears throat> because I think it's one of the roots of this particular era. If you look at the justifications for slavery, and I've talked about this before, so I won't belabor this too much, you have this movement from shame in the institution in the 1770s, 1780s, this belief that it is going to die out anyway, and that and eventually the United States will solve this problem, to in about the time of the Second Great Awakening, you begin to hear this idea that the United States has a peculiar institution, that is something that we're kind of ashamed of, but will, you know, will eventually... Um, perhaps will eventually die out, but it's just something that's unique to um, the United States and um, not unique to the United States. It's something immemorial, but something that in the United States, it's our peculiar institution. There's a little bit of a, like an embarrassment about it, but not total shame, not total admission that it's going to disappear. Then by the time he gets to the Civil War, it's a positive good. This is happening in these justifications for slavery, which are taking place in a religious context, because just as the Second Great Awakening is exploding all over the country as, a, as different forms of religious 
Depression, you're having this also happen in the South among slaveholders who are sort of trying to entrenching themselves and believing that their own reading of Christianity and their own reading of um, religion um, justifies their lives. Um, let me get out of this for one second. I just want to make sure that this is still doing what it should be doing. It says it's recording. Okay, that's fantastic. We are back to business. Uh, so let's talk about slaves. Because um, when the Second Great Awakening idea first uh, came about as a sort of historical idea to explain this period of time, explain all of this creativity and religious expression, political expression, et cetera, Slaves kind of got left out of that story. The, 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 because the, the original formulation of this um, among many historians was that this was something which was taking place among abolitionists and taking place uh, among uh, different religious expressions, the temperance movement, et cetera, and didn't necessarily involve slaves. But we've, when you look at it, it's clear that this is something which is involving slaves. Why was it important? Well, slaves do not have, uh, did not have a lot of writings. There was not a lot of documentary evidence to determine what was going on in slave communities in relation to the Second Great Awakening. But if you look, and I think one of the main touchstones of this is if you look at slave spirituals, if you look at these songs, which have become sort of these American standards, uh, become these kind of American, part of American standard music, these, the lyrics in these songs are the documentary evidence, or one of the forms of documentary evidence that we can see for the explosion of um, this, this galvanization in the religious life of slaves. Many of these spirituals might be much older than this. But in the 1820s and 1830s, you start to have at least a, certainly a recognition, and we see this when we see um, um, white travelers that go to the South and hearing, for instance, um, slaves sing, and hearing their the messages that are in these songs, there's a profound connection of the, the, the idea of the Christian exodus and the sort of perfection of the world which is to come is not necessarily a perfection of the world to come upon death. That it is a perfection of the world that is going to come perhaps in the lifetime of the slaves who are singing it. That liberation, all of these ideas, these profound Christian ideas of liberation, and spiritual liberation are going to come soon and that those who have you know those who have engendered this system and created this system they are going to be laid low and they 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 are the evil doers they are the sinful ones and now slaves can't sing this on a plantation overtly they can't sing a political song or a labor song for instance on a plantation talking about but they can code it inside these religious, it might seem like a Christian hymn that they are singing, but in many ways it's also a, a form of political liberation and a call for rebellion in some senses. Um, some of those songs could be, for instance, of course, we have Swing Low Sweet Chariot. Let me show you the lyric to this. Um, one way that you might look at the literal meaning and then the coded secret meaning um, are that Swing Low Sweet Chariot could just be a hymn. Come down from above, heavenly vehicle coming to take me to heaven. I looked over the River Jordan, a group of angels is coming to take me to heaven, right? Um, but then there's another meaning. And that other meaning, the political meaning is, look, the Underground Railroad is this sweet chariot that's coming to take me to freedom in the north. And going across the river, I looked over Jordan, I looked over this river, could be the actual geographic crossing of rivers that one must cross in the dead of night to get to the promised land of the north. And increasingly, this geographic, religious, spiritual map is being created in the spiritual, such that when slaves are singing to each other about this, this period of hope, it, it, yes, it could actually be, in, it might be upon death, that this deliverance, all the things that, all the injustices that would be faced could be righted in death, but perhaps they will also be righted through revolution today at some point. And you're starting to see this in, in uh, Christian religious expressions. Um, in, uh, um, there's many um, spirituals. Um, uh, let me, I, I'm gonna play one here, this, this version of Swing Low Sweet Chariot. Um, I also wanna make sure that this records it. So, uh, but we'll just play this really quickly by the Fixed Scoobly Singers. 
who have been around since the uh, post Civil War period. Uh, this group, um, and they've made standard many of these um, many of these songs. It's more of a choir um, version of Swing Low Sweet Chariot, but, um, and there are certainly much more upbeat version, but this is a song that's been recorded hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in many different forms um, and has its roots as a, um, as a spiritual. Um, and there are many, many more. Um, in fact, you can make the argument that most American music has its roots in, um, in uh, slave spirituals from the American South. In many ways. Um, you guys still there? Can you hear me? Everybody there? Can you hear me? I, I, I hear you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just always got to check. Never know if this thing is working. Um, so, anyway, I am going to skip a couple slides here. Um, and this this uh, um, one expression that uh, so you can think of these songs as a form of rebellion in a sense. Um, they are you might think of it as a minor form of rebellion, but in a very strong way, they're a way of communicating between different groups in um, in uh, southern society and between different. Uh, groups of slaves on a different plantation as well. They, they sort of bring these songs with form of, remember, many slaves at this point are increasingly not being allowed to read or not being afforded um, the ability to learn how to read. And so songs and oral communication become the only way by which they can communicate the message of their condition and what they believe is to come. During this period of time, between say 800 and 840, you're starting to also have a series of rebellions 
which while none of them are successful in the sense of cracking slavery or ending slavery, all of them are only repressed and result in the execution of many of the ring, supposed ringleaders and um, you know, conspirators, etc. Many of them come from a union of religious liberty as seen on behalf of slaves and seen by slaves. You have, and I'll skip down to Toussaint Louverture, and I've talked about the Haitian Revolution before as being sort of the most radical of the democratic revolutions which come after the Revolution. But the Haitian Revolution is seen with great fear among slaveholders in the American South. It's seen as what could come to um, North America could come to the United States, that slaves could rebel in the extent of form an army which could come and essentially slaughter slaveholders and their families throughout the South. This fear is palpable in the South after the revolution. And you have the of any form of armed rebellion is squashed quickly. And we know of those forms of armed rebellion that we have documentary evidence of are just the ones that make it to the papers. Remember, there might be many, many, many more of these which are being crushed and are never being um, advertised for fear of causing a wave of them. It's like a epidemic. It's like a disease, in a sense. If you allow these ideas of rebellion to get out, the South, it's the interest of slaveholders to In 1831, we have the Nat Turner Rebellion in Virginia the rebellion which is really kind of like the haitian revolution moment for southern slaveholders they think that this perhaps could have resulted in that type of revolution if it had not been crushed as it was nat turner is executed as are all of his conspirators who is nat turner well nat turner is a product of the second great awakening nat turner is a preacher he can read he's actually hired out by his supposed owner to go to different plantations and preach to different groups of slaves he he uses that power that he being able to read and being able to interpret religious ideas for other groups and being able to communicate with different groups on different plantations to come to come up with this idea for an armed rebellion, which takes place in 1831. This armed rebellion kills dozens of white um, uh, of whites in Virginia and their families, um, and the complex plans that Nat Turner associates certain signs in the heavens with being propitious for the, the day of rebellion, sees the sun, has these visions, has these religious visions. And Nat Turner, you might look at his beliefs kind of like ultra-religious and strange, but in a sense, Nat Turner is really a genius in um, the context of what he is doing. Um, the most important thing about the Nat Turner Rebellion is not only is he captured, and then he supposedly writes a confession uh, about what he did. But his work, the confession of Nat Turner, goes to the North with Nat Turner. Southerners think of him as a demon, but you start to see this bifurcation between the North and the South, where the North, many in the North be like, well, yeah, he's going to rebel. He's enslaved. Yeah, it is justified. In the South, you see view being seen as oh the north is crazy and then the south they start to become even more paranoid than they were during the time of the after the haitian revolution at armed rebellion by slaves but remember nat turner is a product of the second great awakening a product of this so we see all of these um these uh things tied up to um I'm going to skip out of this a second. I just want to make sure this is recording one more time. It's recording for this. Um, is abolition. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Abolitionism does not come from people who are just sort of waking up one day and going to work and being like, I think I'm going to become an abolitionist. Abolitionism comes from American religious expression. Look at same year that Nat Turner's Rebellion occurs. Lloyd Garrison, a abolitionist in the North, founds the paper, The Liberator. The Liberator is a paper which is unapologetic about what it believes about slavery. Um, it does, Garrison, 
founds the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Garrison does not believe when he asked, there are many of these ideas in the American Colonization Society that slavery should be gradually phased out, um, that somehow there should be some sort of political end to slavery, some sort of, uh, none of these are working. And Garrison says, you know when slavery should be ended? Slavery should be ended yesterday. Sla every day that slavery exists in the United States is another day in which the United States itself exists in unredeemable sin. That every person who every day does not work every day, if you are not doing everything you can on each day of your life to ending this monstrous crime, you are participating and aiding and abetting in that crime. And Garrison is very, very clear about this, very, very strident. And his words, become incredibly attractive to many abolitionists in the North who already feel this way. They feel, yes, this is clear. There is no compromise. There is not going to be any compromise between half slavery and abolition. Slavery must be ended today, full stop. And this, this, this simplifies for many people, their feelings on slavery. All of those ideas are, oh, should there be some sort of idea to try to repatriate, repatriate African Americans, quote unquote, back to Africa, which is the idea of the colonization, colonization society. Should there be some sort of political, um, no, free your slaves. That's what you must do if you're a slave owner. There's no other way. Harrison is also, we're gonna talk about this in terms of abolitionism being a vehicle to women's rights. Um, he also believes in equal rights for them. Another famous individual in this is Theodore Dwight Weld. Um, Theodore Dwight Weld is a, like many uh, abolitionists, does not start off as an abolitionist. Starts off as a social reformer and a particular out of the Second Great Awakening, but he's against temperance. He's against, excuse me, not against temperance. He's against the consumption of alcohol, which is a very broad-based and very powerful movement beginning in the 1820s and 18s. Um, and he moves from temperance and gradually believes that abolition is really the cause of the day. Yes, temperance is important, but abolition is the real cause of the day. And Weld says, just as Garrison does, all Americans are complicit in slavery. Your participation in the system of the United States, which is a slave society, whether there are slaves in your community or not, you are responsible for ending this, just like Garrison. Um, and I'll talk, we'll talk about American slavery as it is. I'll talk about this now. Um, you have perhaps the most famous female abolitionist of the era would be the Grimke sisters. There's two of them, Angelina and Sarah. Angelina is a some becomes somewhat more famous for her marriage to Theodore Dwight Weld. Um, she actually ends up meeting Theodore Dwight Weld, and there's a great PBS mini is called The Abolitionists, which talks about um, um, the rise of American abolitionists in the 1830s and 1840s. And in 1836, Angelina writes a famous work called Appeal to the Christian Women of the South. And this work is a, what's so innovative about it is that, remember, Angelina is Angelina is a South Carolina wo woman, very wealthy, from a very wealthy plantation in the South, who moves up north with her sister because she can't, she cannot, she believes that she cannot participate in slavery any longer, and she must do what she can to end slavery. And she writes the work, Appeal to the Christian Women of the South, it's almost like a letter to her fellow white women in um, the South, former wealthy white women who can read and who can own books and who, you know, are literate, et cetera, in the South, and says, let me ask you a question. What do you think slavery is doing to your family? You know what slavery is doing to the slave family when you sell slaves apart, when you participate in the breaking up families. What do you think it's doing to your family? Because let me ask you a question. Where is your husband at night? Where is the, the, the epidemic of rape and exploitation that occurs on the plantation. Do you think that your husband is faithful to you? And this is what Angelina Grimke is saying to her fellow women in the South. Very powerful, powerful message that later will be taken up and really fictionalized and become ultra popular through 
um, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harriet Beecher Stowe will kind of fictionalize this idea of the slave family versus the white Southern family and how both are torn apart by this system, both in a sexual sense and also in a um, also in a family sense and also in a just a sinful sense. And so all of these things are kind of wrapped up in um, in this idea. Um, 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 I'm going to answer your question in a second. Let me keep going with this. Um, Grimke then writes probably the most famous abolitionist work in 1839, a national bestseller called American Slavery As It Is. American Slavery As It Is is such a deceptively simple work because what American Slavery As It Is is a just taking essentially news accounts from Southern newspapers and putting them into a book. So it talks about slaves and the injuries that were done to them, but it's all from the perspective of slaveholders who were talking about their slaves as this slave was heavily beaten, this slave was murdered, this slave was, and they're talking about it in this kind of dry, boring way to kind of identify escaped slaves. And the idea behind American slavery as it is, is to just take the way that slavery is described by slaveholders in the South in Southern newspapers, which, by the way, are not available to Northern readers, and take these accounts and show how depraved this system is. And that is going, and this is going to be an enormously popular work on the mammoth undertaking um, that really lays bare for many in the North about how how terrible and how how terribly violent the system of slavery is for the slave. Um, another another um, religious expression, as you were, spiritual expression, um, is that of transcendentalism. Um, we talked about Henry David Thoreau in the last, in, in one of the last talks about um, his uh, idea of sort of um, industrialization and sort of being like this beginning of American nature writing. Um, and Henry David Thoreau is an example of a transcendentalist. But transcendentalism is, you think of, and we're going to talk about American religious expressions in terms of denominations, we're talking specifically in terms of Mormonism, and we talk about it in terms of social reform movements. But transcendentalism is almost how American spirituality starts to develop and how American creative expression starts to coalesce during the same time. Transcendentalists, most transcendentalists originally were Unitarians, including Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And Unitarians were what you might call, just for want of a better word, the most liberal of American denominations in the United States in the early 19th century. They, um, they believe that all, to sum it up really briefly, they believe that all religions were one. They were very united with a group called Universalists, um, that they believed all religions were one that all religious expressions on earth were essentially the same. They just talked in different languages. They just talked in different ideas. So Buddhists and Hindus and Native Americans, et cetera, they all be saying the same thing. It's just that they're di almost different religious languages. And so they had a very kind of liberal notion of Christianity and salvation and hell. They really did. Most Unitarians did not believe in the notion of hell. Uh, so they sort of threw out many of these ideas, which were, I guess predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly Christian. Um, they believed in the kind of mysticism regarding the American wilderness and American land. Um, they believed in the power of the American individual to not only choose for themselves, but to be kind of a, a nonconformist, somebody who does not necessarily listen to um, listen to what the crowd is saying somebody that the true innovator the true genius is he or she who goes off on their own and finds truth so that truth is not necessarily what one would find even in any sort of organized religious sense truth must be found mystically inside each individual and so it transcendentalism in a certain sense eschews any form of church going 
at all. It doesn't necessarily say you shouldn't go to church, but says that taking your cues from a religious leader inherently creates problems. Um, it also has this relationship between America and Earth. It's also a response to the Industrial Revolution, a response to sort of nature mysticism. Um, you can see in the roots of transcendentalism, the roots of atheist, new age movement in the 1960s and 70s is often seen as kind of a new pro, uh, transcendentalist movement. Christian science, new thought at the end of the 19th century, the idea of back to the land, all of these ideas are coming about from transcendentalism. Here you have the three major transcendentalists, Thoreau, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and here Mark Miller. I'll go over them quickly. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson is probably the most academic and most famous um, of the transcendentalists. He writes nature. He writes many of these philosophical works, which, um, which have at their root um, thinking about taking many different forms of religious expression and not couching them in any particular religion. Um, he says in Self-Reliance, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. You must march to the beat of your own drum and find your own religious expression. You cannot stay in any particular denomination. You must find yourself. He himself would leave um, Unitarianism. It would leave the pulpit. He would give up his pulpit. He would be a minister to go out on his own as a writer. Henry David Thoreau at the same time, his ideas of civil disobedience, that you must move, move against the state if you feel the state is unjust. And that's a political expression, but it's also expression of philosophy and religion. And Margaret Fuller also, um, the what we call the, the, probably the most famous of the female transcendentalists who would tragically die young in a shipwreck. Believe women also are the spiritual and intellectual equals of men and have a special role in this new world that's being created um, out of the Second Great Awakening and out of these different forms of philosophy. You also have through this at the same time, not totally born out of transcendentalism, but many of the transcendentalists are very much allied with many of these writers. You have writers like Walt Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville and Harriet Beecher Stowe, who are forming an American literature, which is a unique literature, which is distinct from European literature, which is very much about the individual, very much about expression of the land. So you look in Moby Dick, Herman Melville's notion of this great white whale. The whale is the expression of really the earth, of the path of the earth and the of the wilderness, and how to tame this wilderness and not really ever do that. In fact, consume it to a certain point. Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, his song of myself. I sing and I celebrate myself. He says this over and over again. It's not about... Um, and it, Walt Women, this is, I, I love talking about women in photography. He's one of the first people on earth to take pictures of himself almost every year, put as the piece of each of the editions of his book. Leaves of Grass, he changes multiple times over the course of 30 years, from before the Civil War to after. And he has a different picture of himself as he ages in each book. And he's one of the first people to do that. And he says, this is myself. I'm going to show you myself because myself is America. I am America. America is inside me. And he had this very sensuous um, view of the um, uh, his body and the United States and America and what the meaning of nature is. It's very, it's leaves of grass is something which everybody really should read. Um, and of course, Uncle Tyba, we'll talk about that later. Um, sorry, just you know, still, this is still recording. Yes, it is. Okay, let's talk about how ab what abolitionists are doing, um, and I'm um, at this period of time. Um, abolitionists are using many of these religious revivals as a model for what they do, they're holding rallies. They're holding large-scale meetings of abolitionists. They're publishing um, massive amounts of literature, which they're sending down south, and they call it spamming the south. They're sending these tracts into southern post offices with the hope that some of them will get out and get not only to slaves, but like-minded people in the south. In fact, the U.S. Congress passes a law saying that you can't do this. 
So they're they're basically taking this idea of tracting and pamphleting, which is common in uh, from American religious sects and groups of the early 19th century and using it for abolitionism. And of course, you have tactics. Um, some of the things that they're also doing is that the formation of the Underground Railroad actually trying now not not many slaves escape through the Underground Railroad. Many do, but in the whole scheme of things, not many do out of the millions that are enslaved. Harriet Tubman, an escaped slave herself, becomes an American hero and a kind of symbol of of uh, a bravery in going back and forth into the South, disguised to bring escaped slaves out of the South into the North and all the way to Canada eventually. And there's a whole system of underground uh, of uh, of uh, way houses and way stations along the route with coded messages outside each that are only known to a certain few to move slaves from the South to the North. Um, and most of this is thwart the fugitive slave law. Again, something which we'll talk about um, in the future. Here again is a uh, here again here is a picture of a, a potential mock-up of Harriet Tubman on the twenty-dollar bill, which this has been delayed for since uh, since 2017. Why is there so much opposition to abolition? Why do so many people get so angry? at abolitionists. And this is something which you see that all the way up until the Civil War, there were repeated instances of violence against abolitionists. I refer you to the image on the right, the murder of Elijah Lovejoy. Um, Elijah Lovejoy is a printer in Missouri who believes very fervently in the context of the Second Great Awakening, in the context of, you know, the passion for social reform, believes that slavery is evil and is printing this in Missouri, printing the, which is a slave state. And he's printing these um, tracks and printing these out of his printing press. And his he's attacked multiple times. His printing press is destroyed. He eventually moves his printing press across the river to Illinois. And in Illinois, in Alton, Illinois, he sets up his printer and he continues to publish these screeds against slavery. We, basically saying not only is slavery is evil, but publishing many of the works of other abolitionists. In 1837, a mob goes to the print, goes to um, his printing house on the Mississippi, takes his printing press, throws it into the river, takes him, he comes out of the, uh, he comes out of his um, business, he's shot five times in cold blood by this mob, which is gathered outside his printing press to, to kill him. His murder is seen across abolitionist communities in the North as a sign that um, that the United States is really coming apart at the seams. That these ideas of everybody can express themselves again, freedom of the press, they do not mean anything in the face of the mob of pro-slavery advocates who will not even stand for any sort of publication of any anti-slavery sentiments whatsoever, such that they will kill the messenger who brings them. Um, so that's that. Why is there so much opposition to it? It's about money. Slavery is the most profitable business in the country. Cotton is the major business in the South. Um, it props up thousands of businesses in the North. And there's just too much money bound up into that for many Southerners to feel any sort of morality about it whatsoever. And it's not just Southerners. Many of these abolitionists are attacked in New York. They're attacked in upstate New York. They're attacked all over the place, abolitionists, for their beliefs, solely for saying that slavery is wrong and slavery is evil. They are attacked and many of them are killed. Other reasons why there's opposition to abolition, there's a growing nativist movement at the time. So you have this attention towards Catholic groups which are coming in, Irish and Germans who are coming into the United States, and uh, seen as sort of foreigners who are coming in and polluting this American Protestant um, world, well, increasingly you're seeing that that nativism also turn interior to seeing slaves as foreigners in a sense, that seeing um, African Americans as, as a group that should be either 
through colonization brought back to Africa, or that they are seen as kind of an other, which is violating this idea of white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism inside the United States, which is allied with Catholicism and allied um, with any forms that do not sort of uphold a white Anglo-Saxon slave owning superiority culture. This belief is eventually obviously going to give rise to in the 1860s and 1870s to the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, which still exists today. And many of these sort of white supremacist groups are beginning in this op abolitionist opposition period where they are sort of putting together these ideas of what does it mean to be an American? Well, many of them believe what it means to be American is it means you are white, you are Protestant, and anything that violates that is essentially um, not American. So th this is a very old idea which comes about during the Second Great Awakening as kind of a reaction against these social reform movements which seek to change um, um, change the United States and change the nature of the United States or what they think is the nature of the United States. This opposition to the abolition you have actually in the 18, you have a gag rule that's passed in the House of Representatives. There's so much opposition to abolition that they actually pass a law in Congress. House of Representatives pass a law that you can't even talk about it. Um, in the Liberty Party in 1840, you actually have a uh, abolition candidate that um, comes up, James Burney. He doesn't do very well, but it's the first national abolitionist candidate that starts to win votes. So you're starting to see this right at the end of the Jacksonian period. And the answer is why there's some op opposition is this is a serious, serious threat to national unity. Abolitionists could destroy the United States. That is just something which a lot of people recognize. And, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Do abolitionists destroy the United States? No, slavery destroys the United States. But um, abolitionism and the, even the expression of it cuts to the core of the cancer that is inside the United States and is embedded in the United States at the beginning of the United States. The problem that is not solved at the beginning is what to do about slavery. It's talked about, it's pushed under the rug. It's sort of band-aided over with a series of compromises which don't work. And abolitionists are just shining a light on something which is abundantly obvious, that the slave system cannot exist with the idea of the United States as a free nation and as a light to the world. It's not possible. Those two ideas of the United States cannot coexist. And for that, abolitionists are attacked, but they are really only shining a light on what is true. Um, I'm going to um, see what we've got. Twenty minutes. Um, uh, so I want to talk about women's rights. This abolitionism is a vehicle also for women. Um, it's a vehicle for um, women's political expression. It's exp a vehicle for women's religious expression, and I, I want to. Talk about this first in terms of abolitionism. Quite talked about Angelina and Sarah Grimke. Uh, they 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 talk about women as domestic slaves. It's a charged word, but they see women as oppressed in the same way that slaves are oppressed. The same system is keeping both populations down and preventing both of them from having political expression. That connecting the two, and very early on, you see this union of women's rights groups believing that they are walking hand in hand with abolitionist groups. Not always, but often they see themselves as having the same sort of goal, which is to perfect the United States by creating a, a more democratic society and a more fair and just society where everybody has the right to have political expression, political representation, religious expression, um, and freedom. Um, Really important to this is the identification of abolitionists in the North, predominantly white abolitionists, but the identification of white women in the North with African American women under slavery. This is obviously not an identification which is one that white women in the North can understand, but they can read and they are literate. 
and they can read Angelina Grimke's appeal to the Christian women of the South. They can read American slavery as it is. They're reading abolitionist tracts. And what they are finding is that they are identifying with African-American women in the South who are part of a family in which there is an oppressive power structure, in which they are seen as second class or they are seen as having no rights whatsoever in some cases. White Northern women also see the slave family as one of those institutions, as you see in Angelina Grimke's work, as this ripping apart of these families is the most monstrous crime of slavery itself, that the slave family is not even seen as a family because it is bought and sold and ripped apart. And these tales of children being ripped from their mothers or wives being ripped from their husbands and vice versa is a something which white women in the North, it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's a story that they can, many abolitionist women cannot get out of their heads. It's what galvanizes them and what propels them forward. Not necessarily their identification with slavery itself, but their identification with the slave family and their own roles and their perceived roles as mothers in the North. They also see, as Angelina Grimke points out, the predominance of rape, the predominance of exploitation of Southern women in the South. Of, excuse me, of, of, of African-American women in the South um, under slavery. Sojourner Truth and Harry Jacobs are both former slaves. Harry Jacobs writes Incidents in Life of a Slave Girl, which talks about this, um, this the, the, the depravity under slavery, which exists between slaveholder and female slaves. Um, Sojourner Truth um, um, goes on a lecture tour in the North, the uh, sort of abolitionist lecture tour, and gives a speech called Ain't I a Woman? Basically talks about her own um, she goes, yes, I was a slave, but yes, I'm a woman too. And my rights as a woman, I should be seen as a woman also. And this becomes sort of a rallying cry for the women's rights movement. She becomes a very important figure on the speaking circuit in the North. Um, an important part of this is if we look at gender at this time, we see the ideas of what women's role is changing. Women's role, is, women are seeing their role as changing. They are, if you look at a, there's a famous book from the 19th century called The New Housekeeper's Manual, which is written by Catherine Beecher, who's a sister of uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. And she writes this housekeeper's manual about how women should act, how they should organize their home. Um, and what's important about this is you might not think of this as a very revolutionary work, and in fact, it's not a very revolutionary work, but some of the ideas that Catherine Beecher is putting forth have the seeds of rebellion in them. For one thing, there's this cult which forms, which we, this is called, we call this the cult today, this cult of true womanhood. And this is a famous um, sort of, um, sort of uh, way of looking at how women were supposed to act in the 1830s and 1840s. One, they were supposed to be the religious leaders in their home. They were supposed to be pure they were supposed to be kind of the fonts of purity and goodness in the home they were supposed to be submissive to their husband who went outside the home but they were also supposed to be domestic and in charge of their home so what took place in the home was their province now that might seem terribly retrograde and terribly sexist and it is but in that is that this separation almost of zones that women in the home were all powerful, not all powerful, but they were in charge. Men went outside the home and participated in political life. Those things about sort of foreign trade that they might participate in or in their business, that's what they do. But when they crossed the threshold into the home, they were under the sway of the women's, um, the, the domestic role of women. So women got to decorate their home. Women got to order their home. Women got to teach children these um not only christianity but what it meant to be an american you see that the forms of american female political expression in the absence of being able to vote come about in these moral reform movements and because these moral reform movements are seen as affecting the home temperance Anti-alcohol is seen as when that man crosses that threshold from coming back from the tavern and is drunk and abuses his children or abuses his wife. Temperance is seen as a way of stopping domestic violence. Temperance is seen as a way of 
uh, ending the sort of insidious um, effect of alcohol in uh, American communities. And it's one of the first ways in which women have a form of political expression. They join temperance societies. They join anti-prostitution societies that seek to save so-called fallen women from the streets of major American cities, where women who do not, who have, you know, who are poor, go, um, you know, go um, to 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 find work in any way possible. Um, you have the the uh, prison reform movement in which women go into prisons and seek to reform uh, how prisons operate, um, and it's a reaction to this urban industrial wage earning life. Yes, men might act outside the home and might have political influence outside the home, but women should have some form of political influence inside the home. What you will find by the time we get to the end of the 19th century is that the major American women's temperance organization comes out for women's suffrage. And in 1920, the 18th and 19th amendments to the constitution are both passed in the same year. One, the the uh, the prohibition of alcohol and two women having the right to vote in federal elections. Both of those amendments come the same year because it is the temperance movement, this moral reform movement of political influence inside the home, in which women are seen as having moral suasion inside the home and should have the right to vote on it, comes to fruition in 1920. And you see these two things come at the same time. I'm going to skip Seneca Falls for later. I'm going to skip. Frederick Douglass for later, because I want to talk about Frederick Douglass in another comment today. But I do want to talk about um, now um, about some of these American utopias. I'm going to continue to check this because last time I didn't do it. Um, um, these American utopian movements. Because again, just as all expressions of religiosity do not take place in the context of these large scale American denominations like Baptists and Methodists, and, although many of them do, um, you start to have the formation of, and just as, excuse me, American abolitionists believe they must to a certain extent perfect the United States and pave the way for, for God's kingdom on earth by ending slavery, this monstrous sin. You have the formation of other utopian movements that see that the perfection of human society is not far off and can be brought to bear through religious practices. One of the most famous examples of this are the Shakers. Um, they're not, they start up before this Second Great Awakening movement. They have their formation in the 1770s with Anne Lee. Anne Lee is a woman. She is the leader of the movement. She sees God as both man and woman, that God is both sexes, um, that God is dual. In that sense, this is a relatively radical notion. And her followers, who come to be called the Shakers, um, because that because they they participate in these dances, which are supposed to be the substitute for sexual intercourse, they believe in celibacy. They don't believe in procreating, and they don't believe in sexual activity at all. That if you join the Shakers, you're supposed to be celibate. Um, and so there will be no children that are born to be shakers, right? That you, to join the shakers, you must join voluntarily. This becomes a problem for the shakers. The shakers eventually die out because they, because one of the main reasons why a religion continues to exist is not through volunteerism, it's through breeding new members. And that's just a fact. Most religions have that as their, as kind of one of their governing principles. So the Shakers eventually die out. I think by the 1930s, you have the last Shakers. But their, their, their communities become really, really popular in the Northeast. You find many people joining the Shaker movement. Um, and, and, and you find Shaker communities. And you still find them today. You find um, the um, Shaker chairs. It sort of profoundly influenced sort of American art and design in many ways as well. The simplicity of Shaker chairs. You have another utopia that takes place in upstate New York, defended by John Humphrey Noyes who believes in utter perfectionism, both in terms of um, nutrition and diet and behavior, but also believes in complex marriage, believes that marriage and inherently there's the problems in marriage create many of the sort of sins in life. That in fact, people should have complex marriages and people should be able to marry different people at different forms of their life. People should be able to um, engage in love, 
sexual intercourse with different people in that community. It's kind of, it's very kind of tightly controlled in its own way, but it noises ideas that this kind of perfection of the world is going to come about through complex marriage, through the sort of changing gender dynamics that way. So again, you're having all these gender dynamics that are going celibacy, complex marriage. We'll talk about this in terms of Mormonism, which comes up with the polygamy revelation uh, through Joseph Smith in a second. You also have forms of American socialism. This is before Karl Marx. Socialism does not invent it by Karl Marx. Socialism as an idea, the idea of a society in which um, all people are equal, and that's roughly what this idea is, comes about through a man named Charles Fourier, a Frenchman, who has this idea of utopian socialism and brings this to the United States and becomes relatively popular among a group of American intellectuals, including transcendentalists. The formation of Brook Farm is a transcendentalist community that is uh, founded on the principle of Fourierism in 1844. It doesn't not succeed, but the idea is that you should create these kind of phalanxes, you should create these kind of communities, these planned communities, which will be socialist in nature, and these will bring about a utopian kind of American form of socialism. Um, but let us move in our last moments here, in our last uh, 10 minutes, to Joseph Smith. Uh, I just want to make sure that you guys are here. Yes, you are. Hello. Hi there, everybody. Um, us um, look at Mormonism. And I find Mormonism to be fascinating stories, I would say, in um, American history. And it's, it's a fascinating story because there's so much to how Mormonism develops, and there's so much in the story of Mormonism which tells us about life during the Second Great Awakening. That's why I'm particularly fascinated by it. Um, Joseph Smith is a fascinating individual in the sense that he is, essentially comes from an extremely poor family, um, a family that experiments with many different forms of American religious expression many different uh, denominations and moves from Vermont and there's actually kind of like a time of great hunger in Vermont in the early part of the 19th century and they moved to upstate New York. Upstate New York at the time, remember the Erie Canal is built across New York around the 1820s, 1830s. Much of this zone becomes wealthy but it also becomes highly populated and many of the people in this um, Erie Canal Zone across the uh, uh, northern New York, become, be, it becomes called the Burned Over District. It's a district which is burned over by, not by fire, but by successive waves of spirituality, successive religious revivals sweep across this Erie Canal um, and uh, northern New York uh, landscape. Smith is right there. And Joseph Smith is a really interesting individual. He grows up in this community. Um, he he settles in this community called Palmyra, him and his family. And Palmyra's way up north in northern New York. And one day, and Joseph Smith was always seen as um, a, a kind of strange individual in his community. And by strange, I mean he was seen as having a kind of spiritual gift or kind of almost a, he was seen as like a, a treasure hunter. And by treasure hunter, I, meant, I mean that he was seen as somebody who could find things. And maybe this was sort of through the art of trickery or magic or, you know, or, or, or through mentalism or spiritual divination. He was seen as somebody who um, would be able to dig up things and be like, wow, look at this artifact I found. Remember, northern New York was relatively uninhabited before the, at least relatively uninhabited by white, Christians during this time. If you go to northern New York, you find places called Rome and Syracuse and Palmyra and all these places that are named after places that, that are this map of the Holy Land from back in sort of ancient Greece and ancient um, the Middle East, right? You have Lebanon. You have all these places in upstate New York that are named after these um, um, places in the Bible. Well, Joseph Smith in 1828 has a vision. He has a vision of a prophet named Maranai 
who comes to the foot of his bed and says, Joseph, go to this place and dig on this hill. And there in the hill, you will find these golden plates. And you, I will help you translate these golden plates. And he goes and he supposedly digs up these plates and he brings them back home. And through the help of a seer stone, a rock that he looks into, he comes to this, he is able to translate these plates, which are written supposedly in kind of Egyptian hieroglyphics, or written in this kind of hieroglyphic language. And what these plates tell him, and he publishes in 1830 as the Book of Mormon, is that Jesus, after his death, did not die, but came to the, came to the new world. And he preached to a group of Native Americans who converted to Christianity. And they became, you know, they, they, they were early Christians. They were then later killed by Native Americans, basically Native Americans who did not believe in them. And so the Native Americans that, that were encountered in North America, he is implicitly saying were either lost Christianity or were part of the group that had slaughtered the early Christians. So you see in this kind of kind of vision, um, and that in the Book of Mormon, and he writes this, he publishes in 1830, one of the most remarkable things about this is most people thought that Joseph Smith was illiterate. The book is written in a language which is so filled with kind of the same kind of language that's in sort of what we call the Old and the New Testament and the Christian Bible. It's filled, it's kind of like supposed to be a sequel to it, it's supposed to talk about this. And what's important about this is whether you're or not you believe that the Book of Mormon is real or Book of Mormon is divine inspiration, what it does for those who believe in it is that all of those, remember, you have Lebanon and Rome and Palmyra and all of these religious and Israel, all these ideas of um, all these faraway places, which are now named after different places in upstate New York, it suddenly enchants the United States as being the new Israel that the United States is the Holy Land. Yes, there's all these faraway places that nobody who's read the Bible has ever been to, right? Um, but now the United States is this new Holy Land. Um, and whatever you think about Joseph Smith and whether his revelation is true and any of that, right? And whether you, what do you think about him being kind of like just kind of like a religious savant who kind of comes up with this idea? The people who follow him believe fervently that this is true. And they follow him out west as his vision is increasingly kind of maligned by different groups. That they kind of have a what we call a persecution complex. They constantly feel that they're persecuted, um, and they constantly are moving to places where they will be accepted. They eventually, their tenants are basically a lot of these kind of American in, industriousness, business-oriented tenants which come, which are very popular at the time in the 1820s and 1830s, as well as this kind of vision of the United States as this holy land. They go to Nauvoo, Illinois. They want to form their own community. They do not want to be bound by the laws of the United States. Um, Joseph Smith is imprisoned. He is thrown out of the window of a prison in Illinois and is killed. Before that, he has this revelation that all Mormons should be able to take multiple wives. Many people see, many people, many Mormons leave the Mormonism at this time, seeing this as just a play for Joseph Smith to have multiple wives. They're seeing this as quite cynical. He is murdered in 1844. The church actually splits. There's actually a, a smaller group of Latter day Saints, which actually still has their headquarters in Illinois, Missouri area. Um, but the bulk of them, led by Brigham Young, who gives his name to Brigham Young University, brings these former followers of Joseph Smith, these believers in the Book of Mormon, and brings them to the shores of the Great Salt Lake in 1846, where they settle and found the Church of Latter-day Saints, and they found the city of Salt Lake City, and essentially found really what would become the state of Utah. Um, and at the beginning, they want to have their own separate country, but eventually, you know, they, they, that, that obviously does not happen. In fact, there's a war in 1858 between the United States and, called the Mormon War, quote unquote, between the United States forces and um, the um, these Utah settlers. Eventually, the it's not a huge war; it's more of a series of skirmishes. But Utah does eventually become a U.S. state. But 
Mormonism is entrenched as the major religion in the state of Utah even today. And Mormons are, um, um, they call themselves one of the fastest growing religions in the world or the fastest growing religion in the world. And certainly the message of Mormonism is a peculiarly American message that comes from this, um, that comes from this second great awakening because it's a wholly American born religion. Um, and it's what makes it very compelling that you can read into the history of Mormonism the history of the United States from the 1830s to the present day. And there's a lot more I can say about Mormonism. I think I teach an entire um, lesson.